Hello, I'm Caden from 18438 Wolfpack and I'll be talking about our autonomous failsafes. Jumping straight into it, this season we had 11 failsafes during the autonomous period. And we had these failsafes for two main reasons. One, mechanical problems that could happen during the game, which we would want to avoid to continue to score points during autonomous. And second was game specific considerations that we uh, took into account when designing our autonomous. One example of a physical problem that we ran into was if a cone got stuck in the intake while it was retracting. If a cone got stuck right here, it would cause the motors to draw so much current that it would cause a rev hub to restart. And this is a problem for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it meant our autonomous crashed and we wouldn't park. And secondly, it meant that we would have to wait a couple seconds to start scoring during teleop. Another um, example from this game specifically that we thought was necessary was to take into account if we had collided with other robots, especially due to this year's centerline rules. So the one that came up at Worlds was when our robot was pushed out of position and recognized that it was being pushed by another robot, drove away, drove back, and reacquired its position to continue scoring. My goal with this video is not to walk through the specific examples, although I will for a couple because I think it'll be helpful to demonstrate, but mainly to convey the thought process we used and how we chose to address these problems. The first thing that I highly recommend of any team is know the sensor input that you're getting. Uh, at the beginning of this season, I didn't know current draw sensing was a thing, but I was introduced to it by my team and it has led to a bunch of fail saves. For example, uh, a lot of the fail safes to do with our intake, or as well as our depositor, have to do with current draw sensing and also velocity sensing. And kind of getting into that more deeply, beyond understanding the raw input you can get from sensors like their position, the amount of draw, if brake beams are broken or not, you can also develop other raw sensor input from combining a couple of these together. A really obvious example of this is when you use position in conjunction with time and you can get velocity. So for the example where we were pushed out of position and then drove away and drove back to position, two things had to be true at that point in time. The first thing was that we were no longer in position. And you'll notice as soon as that happened, the entire robot contracted. The second thing that happened is while it was still attempting to reach position, it recognized its velocity was zero. And this meant another robot was blocking it and that the only way to get back to position would be to drive away and come back. So how we actually came about developing these fail safes is we said, okay, this is the raw input we have. I know my position, I know my velocity, I know the current draw out of these motors. What would, if, what would I do if I were the robot? And I'll walk you through an example on our intake. So our intake is probably the most complex singular subsystem in terms of the fail safes involved, as some of them aren't exactly fail safes, but when recognizing that we're reaching position. So we don't extend to a specific length, um, but rather we run at a power until the sensor input lines up to what you would expect would happen if you were at a cone stack. So the first thing that happens when going to reach for the cone stack during autonomous is the intake slides start extending. If the intake and, and we also have a motor encoder on the intake, and that's a key point in a lot of these fail saves, is if the intake stops, either because the current draw has spiked beyond an amount we say is unsafe and it could crash the rev hub, or that the, we use the encoder text and determine that the velocity is zero of the intake. Well, if our encoder position says that we're this far out, clearly we're not at the cone stack. So that must mean another robot's blocking us or a cone is blocking us, for example, that gets in the way of the wheels. So our response to this is to bring the slides back in and extend them again. Moving on from that, if it goes to position, and at this point the claw is probably out, if it goes to position and then they get stuck here, and let's say it's on the high pole, so ideally it would be extended all the way out here, but instead in this case, it's only extended this far we've most likely passed where another robot would be or most likely pushed any cones out of the way that could have been brought over by our opponent. So if we reach out and then we detect that the brake beams in our claw aren't broken, that means the claw is not at the cone stack. So that means that the entire system 
has effectively gotten stopped either by the resistance in the slides that can vary from auto to auto or some other random interference. Our way of addressing that rather than assuming we are at the cone stack is once again to retract and re-extend, but this time with more momentum. As um, you'll notice during our autonomous videos, we extend to a fixed position while we're still placing and then extend more after that. And that's sometimes what causes the intake to get stuck. So we would then fully retract and fully extend to give more momentum to the claw so that it can reach its target position. The next thing that happens is that there are actually two stages of brake beams. One of them is with the claw. So when the claw is closed, the brake beams are broken and these are mainly used during teleop. But like I said before, to also detect when we reach the cone sack, we have another fixed pair that is up slightly higher and that means that these are always in line and should always be um, not broken as long as there's not a cone in the intake. So the next fail safe is if we grab and then we retract and then we get to here and the intake slides start retracting. We're like, okay, if these brake beams aren't broken, that means we don't have a claw in our grasp. So what we should do is we should re-extend again and go reach for the cone stack, returning to the same state as before. Adding on to that and kind of going back to where we were before, if the intake slides start retracting here, what happens if the motors say they've stopped again? Well, that means something's probably in the way on this side. So depending on our current extension, if we're almost at nearly full extension, then we don't want to interrupt the cone stack. Most likely what happened is that there's another cone stuck behind this wheel. So it'll just extend a little bit and then retract a little bit to try and nudge that out of the way. For another case, if a cone is all the way, if our slides are retracted all the way this far and they've stopped, we're like, okay, there's probably a cone in the way. So what should happen is the entire robot should drive while extending the slides and retract. And that's what we found to be the most effective maneuver to dislodge a cone from our intake. Kind of building on top of that idea of utilizing sensor input, um, we have even more sensors both on our claw so that we could detect when another robot was in front of the pole and not score while they were scoring, to utilizing this set of intake claw brake beams again after we've transferred to know if a cone is still in the intake and that if we failed to transfer or not and we would need to repeat it. For us what it was was understanding all the sensor input we had and understanding where we could add more sensors that could be used in a variety of manners. And this, I, I love going back to this example of the claw mounted brake beam, as it's just so versatile for basically anything involving the claw, you know if there's a cone in it or not. It was understanding where to put all the sensors so that they're most usefully utilized to get the most out of our autonomous and make it as dynamic, but also quickly responsive as possible. As they're only 30 seconds in the game, we only had an extra five seconds to spare on other autonomous maneuvers. And so another huge part of this was, this was effectively the robot design that we had come up with um, by our first qualification. And what that meant is we had almost the entire season working with the same robot to be moved past simply, okay, we have a good autonomous that's reliable and quick. How can we make it withstand real world interaction? And that was a huge balance struck between the hardware and software team that we did really well this season. I cannot emphasize how useful it is to have a good communication between your hardware and software team as it allows much more creative and um, exciting things to happen within the game. So this along with my past the movement video um, is everything I've done this year and everything I hope to pass on to the years to come to hopefully make those autonomous battles just a little bit more interesting.